Hi, and welcome to OutThink, a podcast all about mental health in the LGBT community. I'm Lawrence Akers. I'm a clinical hypnotherapist. And this episode, we're going to be talking with Stu Fenton. Now, Stuart is a clinical psychotherapist and counsellor. He also has the added experience of being a recovering drug addict and alcoholic. And that's what today's OutThink is really about, is, is looking at addiction, particularly ice addiction in this instance. It's a topic that I've wanted to discuss for a while, but understandably, it's a topic that can often be a bit harder to find suitable guests. Given Stuart's experience and his uh, 15 plus years of helping people to break their addiction and to, to find a healthier lifestyle, he's been the perfect person for us to speak with. So enjoy today's podcast with Stuart Fenton. So, Stu, tell me what kind of issues exist with ice addiction in this day and age? <laughs> That's a very big question. It's a massive big question to start off with. Uh, I gave mm-hmm. the big picture one here. So. Yeah, no, because I was just at the um, second uh, European Chemsex conference in Berlin and, you know, it became very... Um, clear that the issues kind of stretched a lot further than I could, well, that I've ever even experienced. And I've been sort of involved with this for 12 to 13 years, I guess. Mm. And, you know, I don't know if you know this, but the the chemsex epidemic is, you know, it started in really in the States, probably in the gay community 20, 25 years ago. And then it really was in Australia next. And uh, it's only just exploding in um, the UK and Europe now. Um, And a lot of the studies are done are are showing that. And so, you know, especially when when I was, uh, you know, involved in the in the whole chemsex thing, like this is back 15 years ago, the main issues, I mean, there's a lot of issues, but a lot of I mean, if I had to try and string them all out, I would say there's obviously addiction. There's um, a lot of lack of self-care. There's mental health issues like depression and anxiety and um, there's also, um, people becoming infected, you know, the whole barebacking thing was becoming, um, you know, very popular back 15, 20 years ago, mm-hmm. whereas, you know, um, prep has sort of come in and created a whole lot of other problems now, which are huge over here, which is like STIs, a syphilis increase and, you know, many strains of gonorrhea and, um, and also gonorrhea that there, you know, there was a recent case where they didn't think they could cure one person of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it is getting, it's going to be a real problem in the coming years, um, because of this. And, uh, there's also, A lot of issues with assault and rape um, that are coming up, especially in the UK. Um, There's people getting involved with child pornography. I mean, I'm I'm talking about the whole gamut now. These aren't necessarily the most popular ones. But when people are, you know, involved in those sort of circles and they're they're, um, taking a lot of drugs and they're around a lot of people, um, you know, they start to get... um, make poor judgments or, you know, have problems with their ethical judgments. There's been also, you know, and this, some of the things I'm saying I haven't actually heard of in Australia, not to say they haven't happened, but, Hmm. you know, there's been apparently uh, bug chasing and, you know, trying to purposely uh, contract HIV and hepatitis C are things that happen in the UK. But, I mean, if I had to talk about the most um, common ones, it would be mostly around addiction, men not taking care of themselves, not taking care of other people, uh, descending into kind of very – oh, crime, obviously, is another big one, and drug dealing. Yep. Um, And um, there's probably a whole lot more, but that's just right off the top of my head. Yeah. And and that's the thing. Like, I mean, I know it's it's such a massive topic uh, that I think many people don't really – understand it beyond the addiction uh, phase mm-hmm. that's there. Um, and, you know, the media often present <coughs> ice and ice addiction as being epidemic, and you used that word before yourself, um, and ice users as being overly aggressive. What is your thoughts on this? Do you believe that it is epidemic? Um, oh, I hope I didn't use the word epidemic just, just then. <laughs> because I'm trying, I'm try, I am trying not to do that, and it, and it is a result of... A bit of a backlash in the you know psychotherapeutic sort of um, industry because it a lot of people say it's not really an epidemic and it isn't 
necessarily an epidemic. It's not an epidemic in Australia either. In fact, mm. crystal meth is the seven most most common drug in a, used drug in Australia now. Uh, you know, the top ones are alcohol, tobacco, yeah. um, prescription drugs, marijuana. So it's falling down the list now. And, you know, the reason that it was always um, called an epidemic was – more so because of, I think, what media, the media did yeah. with, you know, all the psychotic incidents and the, the girls going ballistic, um, you know, at emergency rooms and kicking in the back of police cars. And, you know, of course, when they show those sorts of things on the media, people go, oh, my God, even my parents still always talk to me and say, oh, ice is out of control. And I say, mm. you know, alcohol is causing Far much, far, far more damage than ice is. It's just that the media is creating um, a situation that makes it look like an epidemic. So, in in Australia, I don't think it is an epidemic anymore. You know, or um, it isn't as uh, critical as it was. I'm not saying it's a it's a whole lot better, but I think it's. I really kind of have a sense it's plateaued or is a little bit less now. Yeah, and especially in the LBGD community too. I was looking at some statistics just the other day. And the, the use of crystal meth and um, GHB has actually dropped significantly um, in the gay community over the last four years. Why do you think that is? Is that uh, people are beginning to uh, find that it has become a problem for them and they're, they're finding their way back again? What do you think has caused that, that return back to... That's a, that's a pretty good question, and I haven't been living in Australia now for the last eight months, so it's mm. hard I've not kind of got my finger on the pulse as much. When I saw those statistics, I did think to myself, that's interesting, and my mind did go to maybe a lot of the ways that um, Australia reacted to the crystal meth problem, like when it really started to hit, which was in sort of, I guess around 2000 to 2008, Australia and and places like Acon and whatever developed all their programs and Crystal Meth Anonymous began and all these different services uh, began to counteract that. So it could well be that people got the message and, you know, I know that I also know that within the gay community uh, there was a lot of people um, who really took a stand against their using crystal meth and their friends using crystal meth and stuff like that. So it could well be that um, people are listening to the the warning signs and the messages and 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 they're just going back to some of the old faithfuls like ecstasy and alcohol and stuff like that. The only other thing I think of is that it could also be that because you know they spent a, a huge amount of money on police trying to, um, you know, um, what's it called, uh, block uh, crystal meth coming into Australia. There were a lot of seizures and that sort of stuff. So that may have had some impact on it as well, but I, I'm not so convinced about that second possibility. And, of course, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure of um, which which study or, or survey it was that you're, you're mentioning there, but, you know, in my own experience, I think a lot of um, – there are probably a lot more people out there who have used ice and perhaps a water prepared to step forward and be openly admitted to. I think there's a lot of stigma attached to that particular drug more than any other drug. Why do you think that is? To crystal meth? Yeah. Um, I think it's probably because of the, the um, uh, probably a, a few different things. One is the psychosis that they witness people in that's attached to that. You know, it's a lot more prevalent with this particular drug. I think also because there's another kind of road that people go down, which is um, as they become addicted to it, especially daily users, they start to not look after themselves, not shower, not eat, and they they visibly become quite, you know, gremlin-like and yeah. and very kind of scary, to be honest. And so a lot of the um, results of people using crystal meth, especially in the gay community, doesn't end well and and in the end when people are using it uh, a lot it doesn't look great either you know and uh, in in my experience the gay community hasn't got a very deep history of using heroin or opiates you no. know it's a very rare so and that's the only other drug that kind of has the the kind of extreme intense reputation that crystal meth has and yet the thing about crystal meth, I think, is that when people start using it and in the and people can use it for a number of years, 
you don't have to inject it like heroin. You know, you can smoke it in this glass pipe. I think some people kind of see, see it as cool. And I definitely know years ago, 15 years ago, when I was doing it in the US, when it was before it really got out of control there, it was kind of cool to go with someone into a toilet cubicle and have a few burns on a pipe and, you know, the smoke evaporated quickly. There was no mess. You put it in your pocket. You were back out on the dance floor. It became, it became a little bit like, you know, having a smoke behind the shelter shed at school, you know, yeah. and it was you're off and on your way. I think um, also because crystal meth makes gay men hypersexual and so they can be able, they're able to do things that they couldn't do before. And again, some of this is from my personal experience, remembering the way that, you know, people at sex parties wanted you to take crystal meth because you become, you know, this fantastic power bottom and mm. you know do all these extreme things that that was very exciting and so and and i think there is just anyway a lot of low self-esteem in the gay community so when you find a drug that uh, that allows you to do these sexual behaviors and be this person and get this validation from the people around you there seems to be a lot of good happening to it and furthermore you know also just in um, the sense of working. I mean, over the years, I've known a lot of crystal meth users who are lawyers and barristers and, you know, uh, have very um, respectable jobs who are mm. able to use this drug, you know, they would say manageably in moderation over spans of years and be able to show up to work and do their job. So it's it's kind of not like heroin where you become more or less fairly quickly unmanageable. Yeah, there's the, the functioning addict side of it. Um, yes, yeah. and and that's the thing. Like, I mean, obviously, um, some of the questions I'm asking today are potentially obvious in some ways, um, but I guess just to to help perhaps listeners who may not be as aware of some of the definitions that exist out there. And I guess my my question here um, relates to that. You know, obviously, not everyone who uses ice ends up becoming an ice addict. Um, but how do you define when someone is becoming an addict or has become addicted to it? Um, I generally use three or four criteria and that is um if you're using the drug against your own will like you're saying to yourself i don't want to do it i don't want to do it and that you end up doing it anyway you put yeah. strategies and and um uh well basically you put strategies in place to stop yourself doing it and they don't work you um you're you're losing time like that you need to be doing the things that you want you you're feeling unhappy about it or other people around you are being impacted by it as well mm -hmm. um i think those are probably my main three four criteria because um other i mean because you're right there are a lot of people out there who use all sorts of drugs and would never agree to those three or four criteria okay. I, I just mentioned and I think it often comes down to th their ability to handle uh, a lot of their problems in a, a psychologically flexible way. Like if, if, you know, I'm not wanting to go necessarily down an act road here, but, you know, you have that experiential avoidance uh, that people have with this kind of behavior. Um, do they have other ways of dealing with problems other than just that or not? And if they don't, then I, I think they have had the tendency perhaps to become more addicted from that. Mm. Yeah. I think, I mean, like, especially when, when I work with people, I really say that it's got to come from the person. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's not always the best indicator too because oftentimes you'll have people who are saying, no, I don't have a problem, and it's very clear. Yeah, that, that they do, yeah. Yeah. So, but, but I guess the important point is that my experience is mostly that if a person doesn't put up their hand and say I need to do something, it's very hard to help them. Absolutely. And you mentioned before some of the the side effects of, of ice, but for someone who's never used ice before, um, what does ice feel like for a user and, and what is that appeal? Um, I think with this particular drug, you know, there is slight variation between people. I mean, if we're talking about LGBT people, I think there's probably two or three main reasons people would use it. You know, obviously the one I mentioned before to be hypersexual, it makes gay men super horny mm -hmm. um, and, and allows them to have sex for hours, sometimes days without stopping to be able to, you know, go far beyond their physical limits in different ways that they couldn't do without the drug. I think also, you know, there's a whole lot of people out there and I've witnessed this in Europe, you know, like I've been at some um, circuit parties over the last summer where a lot of people just take it 
to top up and to keep them going. If they go to a, you know, say for a circ- for a festival of dance parties that might stretch over a four day weekend or yeah. a week or something, they'll just, they won't, I mean, of course it'll probably feed into their sexual behavior, but more so they're taking it so that they can make the distance and feel kind of crisp and alert. And they sort of plan in a way to crash at the end of it. And they know they're going to crash, but it's sort of the thing that keeps them awake and um, social for that period of time. Uh, those are probably the two main ones. Well, and I guess the third one is that when people become addicted, they use it to feel normal. You know, once they've reached that point of tolerance, they're just using it like um, a smoker smokes every day, really, just so to keep the cravings at bay. Mm. Um, is ice generally mixed with other drug and alcohol use, or is it generally seen as a, something that people would do as a standalone drug? Oh, I think it's mo- it is actually very commonly mixed. You know, it's, I see a variety of people. It's an interesting question, actually, mm-hmm. because some people are just pure ice users. I know there's some people who, you know, obviously mix a lot of GHB and um, ice together for sexual reasons, and you know, it gets a little bit messy there too. Because, like in the UK, methadone is a very po- popular drug that goes into that mix yeah. amyl's in there as well but then amyl you can't mix with some of those drugs because it's a lethal combination um crystal meth is um you know and then there's some people who who will do it with marijuana which is a very that's an interesting uh, combination by the sounds of it more, more of it uh, more, i think a lot of the time people are doing it to chill themselves down so that they're yeah. able to sleep but you know but the problem is obviously that it's a very both those drugs are big triggers for psychosis so they're not mm-hmm. great together really um and then I think there's a whole bunch of people who party and, and use crystal meth with um, ecstasy, MDMA, you know, as a party drug to feel buoyant, you know, at the clubs or wherever they are. And it probably just nudges their ecstasy along. Yeah. And you mentioned obviously before, uh, you know, some people may be addicted but not realize they're addicted or denying that they're addicted. What are some of the, the challenges that exist in helping people to, to quit their addiction? Yeah, that's the bane of And again, life. I imagine this is a massive, big, broad question because uh, everyone's going to be different again. But, uh, you know, what what do you feel tends to be some of the, the at least some of the strategies that are perhaps are used in, in helping people to move towards recovery or, or being drug-free? Yeah, look, I guess, I mean, and it's not just with crystal meth. I mean, I'm working with a guy at the moment who's a crack user and cocaine user and, um, you know, says, oh, look, I'd be happy to give up cocaine and crack, but I just want to keep smoking pot and alcohol. And, and I mean, it's a similar thing, similar thing with crystal meth because a lot of the people I work with who use crystal meth say the same thing. You know, I, I just really want to give up crystal meth, but I want to be able to drink. And, you know, me personally, I'm a, I'm a very big um, supporter of the abstinence model and the 12-step model. I mean, I'm definitely – I'm not – I don't poo-poo um, harm reduction by any means. Like mm. I see I'm on a continuum – But, you know, sometimes, I mean, just to give you a frame of reference, the way I work is there are drug users, drug abusers, and drug addicts. Drug drug users are the people that never have a problem. Drug abusers are the ones that have a problem and um, are able to kind of either get a bit of counseling or um, do a bit of sort of journaling and a bit of work on themselves over a period of time or get into spirituality and they can pull up on their own. And then there's drug addicts. They're the third category. They're the people that... Um, they say, oh, I'm not going to use crystal meth ever again. And then within three days, they're using it again. They said, I never, I, I said, I would ne- never going to do this. And then a week later, they're doing all the things they said they never would do again. And they're just completely powerless over going back to the drug. Yeah. Now, the way, the way I work is if a person is, says, if I describe those three categories to them and they say, well, I'm definitely in the third category, then I say to them, you probably need abstinence. Mm-hmm. Okay. If, they're in, if they kind of say, oh, look, I think I'm in the middle category, I say harm reduction may work for you. Let's, let's, if you don't want to do abstinence, let's explore all the avenues of harm reduction first of all. Um, I mean, my personal feeling is that, and what I've seen is most people that achieve um, abstinence from crystal meth really have to go down a 12-step road and a residential rehab road initially. And then if later on that, that, that doesn't work for them or they don't like it, they've usually put a really big... A um, lot of space between their using and and that point in time, and then they've got a good chance to 
you know, put a whole lot of supports in their life and, and uh, support groups and have a really good therapist, which may um, help them stay away from this drug. And, you know, mm-hmm. two of the colleagues that I work with have pretty much gone down that road. I mean, my, my own personal journey was abstinence and remains abstinence today because yep. I, I, I've, my journey was that I could never go back to drugs and, and stay away from them. So I know I'm in the third category. Um, so when I'm working with someone who's, who's resistant in that way um, or challenging in that way, motivational interviewing also comes in handy you know mm-hmm. i do just exploring with them especially highlighting and amplifying um the negative consequences of their use you know they often will drop things into the conversation where you say oh what you you missed your mother's birthday because you're on a three-day crystal meth binge and um you know she was calling you and you didn't pick up the phone and you know sometimes when people in early recovery to them that's just become such a part of their life that it doesn't seem like such a terrible thing yeah so a lot of the time i'm trying to amplify amplify and highlight um the negative things that are happening because of their drug use and and just explore with them without being too pushy um really if they think they're in the second group or the third group and then what they might want to do about that so but it is it is incredibly hard because if you push too hard you can push them far away from that place Mm. if you don't hard enough sometimes they just wander off and they continue relapsing Uh, to be honest i would say it's the most difficult and hardest part of this job probably the area i don't like what i love is when a client comes in and goes yes i'm in the third category i'll choose abstinence or Look, I really think I'm harm reduction. So tell me what I need to do to be in this category, and let's work on it now. That that that's heaven for me. Mm. Uh, hell is when when a person is just resistant and and wants to do it their own way, and I can see it's not going to work. In, in how often, or I guess for um, people who do relapse, on average, how many attempts does it take for them until they do start to find a way to become more clean and sober? Oh, that's a that's a very. It's um, a, I guess it, it's a hard one again because we're talking about generalizations, of course. But has yeah, there been any just, statistical research there around how many attempts it often takes? Um, I don't know about statistical re- research about that. I think it's really different for everyone. You know, I was yeah. lucky. I got it. I got it on my second attempt. I've worked in rehabs where people have come back and got it on their eighth trip through rehab. Um, you know, sometimes people get it the first time. I think what it comes down to, and this is what I've worked out over years, is it works out, it comes down to being sick and tired of all the crap that comes along with drug addiction to a point where you just go, that's it, I'm done. As well as getting older has a big part in it. I was thinking of a thing today with what I kind of think of in my own head as the... um, the maturation effect which is sometimes when people are young they just get caught up in that relapse cycle over and over and then by the time they get to their late 20s early 30s they just go you know what i want a life i want to be like my friends i want to get married i want to get have a house i want to get serious about life and somehow that just kicks in and they get it so there's no there's no real golden answer to that i mean there probably is some statistics but you know for some people it can take 10 or 15 years for some people they get it first go yeah I know certainly for people that I've uh, worked with who have been battling addiction, there seems to be this complete lack of self-compassion quite often. They, they tend to be harder on themselves than what anyone else could be uh, to them. What kind of self-beliefs have you come across that you feel help to keep this addictive behavior in place for people? Um, I look, always when I'm working with um, addicts and not just addicts, but a lot of other sort of process addictions as well. I really start with trying to build self-esteem and and setting boundaries. And and so it's a lot of life skills in that regard, learning how to use nonviolent communication. But when it it comes to self-care, like I think it's really finding out what that person likes to do and then um, basically getting them to implement as much of that as possible. Mm. And it's different for everyone. Like for some people, you know, I mean, that's why I like the rehab I work in at the moment. They do so much holistic. Um, so They offer so many holistic options as well as sporting options and exercise options that you can't help but leave this facility finding maybe potentially 10 or 15 new things that you could do. So, for example, 
Um, some people really love going to the gym. Some people really love yoga. Some people really love meditation. Some people love Reiki. Some love sound bowl healing. Some people like bushwalking. Uh, others are into practicing stillness and silence and, you know, others into chanting and then some into dance. And, you know, like what I think is that when a person is at the end of their self-abuse through drugs, there's a little gentle crossover, hopefully, into creating a, um, I don't know, kind of program of self-support where you use these. And it's funny, I was thinking about it today. Like I said, I've been clean for 15 years and I just thought of my life and I thought, oh, wow, look at that scattered through my weekend is all these self-support, self-care activities, which are really a symbol of me valuing myself and looking after myself. Yeah. And I guess that's what I would hope for the clients that I work with as well is that they leave treatment with all these different um, self-support, self-soothing, uh, stress management um, activities that are all a symbol of I love and value myself um, so much that I'm not going to use drugs or abuse myself anymore. Mm. How much – because, you know, I, I always say I tend to believe that the LGBT community have a, a very unique relationship with shame. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, as, as kids, we kind of grow up realizing we are different to the other boys and girls out there, but can't put our finger on it. And I think that that tends to, um, as we get older, still kind of linger there in the background with that whole, uh, need for validation, uh, especially in terms of a, a subculture that can be quite superficial. Um, what work can be done to help people overcome these kind of self beliefs about themselves that, that might often be their fueling that addictive? <coughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I've i um, done a lot of studies in uh, inner child work and developmental immaturity, and, uh, and I think this is a big one. I mean, I know that shame is a big issue, actually, for heterosexual people as well. Oh, but absolutely, right. yeah. It is, it, is a, it is a big issue for us too because I always say that we've got this added unfortunate thing where we grow, grew up um, absorbing um, homophobia, and hatred and rejection yep. from it, from society, from comments that were, you know, dropped left, right and centre around us from school, from our school friends um, and growing up in our workplaces and e even in our families that are that can be incredibly homophobic growing up. So, yes, of course, we absorb all this shame about who we are. So when I – I mean, the, the model that I use incorporates going back into your childhood – really exploring the messages that you received, where they came from. Mm. And and then I do a thing called shame reduction, um, which is actually setting up a lot of situations where you hand that shame back to whoever gave it to you in the first place, whether it was bullies in the playground or it was parents and the comments that they made. And really, I mean, one of the things I'm most passionate about working, especially with LGBT people, is um, – empowering them and, and making sure that they realize that the the way that society felt about them or their family felt about them in regard to homosexuality was never about them. It was about the other people yeah. and it was their problem, except that because you're young and you don't have boundaries, you it unfortunately, you know, absorbs into you and you believe you can end up believing this stuff. And, you know, it's, uh, it's the thing I... I mean, as I'm working in an LGBT rehab now and we've got 10 gay male clients in there at the moment, it's, you're right, it is the thing that I see a lot and it's the thing I hate and I, I'm, I'm really angry that, it, that society has, you know, in a sense done this to us. So, you know, a lot of the work that I'm doing is handing back the shame, letting it go, doing a lot of grief work. Um, doing a lot of journaling, trying to identify where all these uh, messages came from and and being able to hand it back, basically. Mm. I think you're, you're absolutely right there. And, and I think that that work that you, you've described there just sounds absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, I think if, if more people in the LGBT community could be um, comfortable in their skins, uh, more self-accepting and self-compassion, I think would see a, a far less addictive behavior going on out there. Mm. Um what impact has uh, ice addiction had on the relationships of those of the addict? Oh, wow. I think it's far-reaching, you know. Like, mm. 
it depends whether that person's in in a romantic relationship or not, but usually that's the first one that gets affected. And, you know, it's, I mean, in a lot of cases where I work with people, you know, the relationship comes to an end because the partner just can't, gets to a sort of a, a point where they can't deal with it anymore. Yeah. Uh, you know, it definitely affects um, the, the mum and the dad. I mean, I spent four years in Melbourne just up until, you know, eight months ago, working a lot with families and it's one of the most painful things to, for me was for me to work with was especially mums you know they're the ones who are tied by the umbilical cord and yeah. you know just hate to see their son or their daughter basically wasting away and and, and killing themselves so definitely the that those relationships i've worked with a lot of um people who the first person who actually presents in front of me is their their loving sister or loving brother who just says i'm just so scared for them i can see i think he's gonna kill himself and so there's you know if you've got a close bond with a brother or a sister that those relationships i mean i've these kind of people i've had sitting in front of me weeping and weeping i love them so much you know we were so close growing up i don't recognize him anymore um that's heartbreaking um and and then you know as it, it goes on, you know, to grandparents and it goes on to um, people in the workplace, you know, who are concerned. I mean, obviously, those relationships end up with people losing their jobs and destroying their careers and, mm. you know, that as well. So, like, the relationships that get affected by crystal meth are very far-reaching. What advice would you have for, for anyone who's listening who might have a loved one who's battling with this addiction? Well, it depends. It depends where we're talking. If we're talking in Australia, I would, I would recommend um, getting them in touch with Crystal Meth Anonymous, which exists in Sydney and you know in in, in parts of Queensland and uh, in Melbourne. They would need to get in contact with Narcotics Anonymous. You know, the tricky part with the question you just asked me is that there are a lot of therapists out there, like for example in Melbourne, but. Um, you know, I've had clients come to me and say, look, I've had this crystal and meth addiction for years. I've been working with this psychologist, you know, for four years, but nothing has changed. Mm. Now, the way – the thing is, is that I really think you have to go and see someone who is a drug and alcohol specialist if you, yeah. you've got a problem. So many people just go, oh, I'll go and see a psychologist, and they are not necessarily – um, uh, set up to deal with drug addiction. And also, like I said before – Australia has an overarching approach to drug addiction, which is harm reduction. And if you're a person who's in that third category that I said to you before, who really needs abstinence, and you go and see a psychologist who starts to try and um, get you to do harm reduction, you're going to do damage because yeah. that person is going to think, how come I'm doing all this harm reduction stuff and I'm still getting psychosis and I'm still hurting myself and I'm still going on five-day binges and all they're going to end up is more shameful and feeling that they're a failure. So I think it's really, really important that anyone listening doesn't just go and get help through a therapist. They find a, a um, reputable uh, drug and alcohol counsellor uh, mm -hmm. to go and see about this stuff. And, you know, I don't know if um, you can put my website on here at the end. Not for Absolutely. my purpose, yep. because I'm, I'm not in Australia anymore. But what I can do is if anyone contacts me, I can refer them to the people that I think are the best people in Melbourne. Yeah, I think that's such wonderful advice because it is such a, a tricky area that you really do need to go to people who are so skilled in this this space who understand it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you've been very kind before to share with us a little bit about your own story, but what prompted you to go down into this line of work? Um, <laughs> well, I was a school teacher when I was um, struggling with drugs myself, and I wasn't entirely happy doing that. And um, so when I was in rehab, I was watching the therapist working, and I was very lucky to have a great gestalt therapist as my therapist from rehab who helped me so much and, mm. and basically took a lot away, a lot of my shame and my pain and my grief. And, uh, and I felt so much better, and I just remember one day in rehab going, I really think I want to have a go at this and see if I could do this. I think I'd enjoy it. So when I got out of treatment, I sort of waited a while and then I did a, a few, um, I explored doing a, a graduate diploma in counseling and I was enjoying it because I always thought, you know, at least I'll learn more about myself and understand myself better. And, you know, if I turn, turns out I'm not a good therapist, then I, I won't have wasted the money. And then after I finished that qualification, I heard about, uh, 
gestalt therapy and I wanted to do that. So I, I started to study that. And, there, and I think there were just a lot of people that popped up in my path, path that were gestalt therapists. And it was such a beautiful, gentle kind of therapy, um, but also powerful and can be powerful and challenging as mm -hmm. well. And, and I think part of it too was when I got when I got clean, there was no other gay men like um, getting clean from crystal meth and and uh, you know all my therapists were people who weren't familiar with this chemsex sort of scene and I don't think I thought this at the time but it's dawned on me just in the first few years where I became a therapist was um, I wanted to be a person who had more of the answers and more of the empathy and understanding from personal experience to offer to others and you know, sometimes in my quiet moments when I'm working with someone, you know, a gay man who's talking to me about their shame and their, the things that they've done on their crystal meth binge and whatever, you know, and, and I'm, I have, you know, 200% empathy and understanding of where they're at. I just think far out. That would have been awesome for me to have that. I mean, of yeah. course, all the therapists that I had were wonderful and did great job, but this takes it to a whole new level, I think, is to have someone who's even got the personal experience and can say, yeah, I've been there, I understand completely. And I think that's the thing as well is that uh, there is a stigma attached to people who use ice and I think that um, it can be their, their dirty little secret that they hide away um, and feel that perhaps they're shame-filled or, you know, that they're, they're flawed because of the problem. Uh, but as we know, the more that people can open up and express it and talk about it, the more that they can start to move away from that shame and, and get the help that they actually need. Um, speaking of that help, can you tell us a little bit about Resort 12? So um, Resort 12 is a part of the cabin um, services group over here in Thailand, which has been around for about nine years now. And what happened was they noticed that they did have a lot of uh, GLBT people coming through their program, but that they weren't necessarily really set up to offer them something specific for their needs and so uh, one of their owners decided they were moving to a new site they were building new facilities and he said why don't we build a village specifically for lgbt people and he, he's a straight man but he was you know i think this is very very courageous and generous um idea you know and and he has a lot of gay friends and he's seen a lot of the chem sex issues that are exploding in the uk and he said this is timely as well i think this is needed and necessary so that's where the idea sort of came from and i think you know like since working at resort 12 i've done a lot of reading and realized that there isn't an lgbti plus specific treatment facility outside the u.s and um, and and that our needs are um, quite can be quite different to the mainstream and and also the thing that I realised since um, working here is that most rehabs are um, unconsciously set up to deal with uh, heterosexual people. You know, a lot of the the literature they use in the in the handouts and the things that they give out are, are kind of geared towards heterosexuals simply because they're the greater amount of the population, not yeah. because of any kind of homophobia or anything. No. So the great thing about Resort 12 is that, you know, we have LGBTI groups where we look at, you know, internalized homophobia and bullying and stigma and sexuality and masculinity and sober sex and chem sex and all these things that a person would never get in a mainstream rehab. And a lot of our process groups, you know, get you have like a whole group of men talking about all the idiosyncrasies that would happen um um, for gay men in a gay context, which they would never be able to talk about in a mainstream process group. So I think what is um, really fantastic about Resort 12 is that people don't have to censor themselves. And so like what we were talking before in regard to shame, that whole level of censoring myself because I'm not sure how the room is going to take this information is mostly wiped out because... Yeah. Um, people go, well, the people in here, if they haven't had the experience, at least they're, they're going to be less likely to judge me for it. Hmm. Stu, I won't take up too much more of your, your time today, but I really want to thank you for your time just to, to chat about this topic. As I mentioned um, to you before, it's, it's one of those ones I've always wanted to talk about, but it can be quite a, a sensitive one for people to step forward and, and to be able to share. And I think um, the combination of your experience uh, – both as a person who's gone through this and as a person helping people to recover is just such a, a brilliantly, brilliantly unique uh, opportunity to tap into. So thank you so much for that. 
Thank you. It's um, my pleasure. Um, if people wish to get some more resources or to perhaps get in touch or anything like that, how can they best do that? I think just uh, through my website, which is www.beyondaddiction.net.au. Great. Um, thanks again. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs>